Hello everyone, and welcome to the latest in the local history talk series from Leeds Libraries. I'm Anthony, one of the librarians for the local and family history department at Leeds Central Library, and today I'll be exploring the brief history of cemeteries in Leeds from the 19th to the 20th centuries. A couple of things to note before we begin properly. This is far from a comprehensive or complete history. Instead, it's a rather partial or anecdotal history. Based as it is entirely on items of stock that we hold at the Central Library. Jim Morgan's book, The Burial Ground Problem in Leeds, remains the best narrative history of the subject as a whole, and one I can highly recommend. In fact, much of my narrative derives from Morgan's book. You could, in fact, think of the talk as a synopsis of that book, illustrated with materials from the library collections. I also want to emphasize before we start properly. The difference between the two main types of burial grounds, a church graveyard and a non-religiously affiliated cemetery, usually those operated by local administrations such as councils, are known for that reason as municipal cemeteries. It's the latter we are primarily concerned with today, though our story does inevitably intersect with religious institutions. So to begin properly, Prior to the mid 19th century, Leeds people were almost always buried in the church graveyards I just mentioned, such as the ones you can see on the screen here. The Leeds Parish Church on the left, where all residents of the Leeds Parish were entitled to be buried on payment of a fee to the vicar. And the old St. Michael's Church in Headingley on the right, one of the seven townships within the parish that had its own churchyard by the 18th century. Residents of those areas were entitled to be buried in the grounds of either the parish church or their local township church, the latter being more expensive as a fee was payable both locally and to the vicar of Leeds Parish. Often, however, local burial would still work out cheaper owing to lower transport costs. But even with that, only a minority of the township around Leeds had the facility to bury their parishioners. So the majority of local people were still being buried in the parish graveyard. Increasing population numbers through the late 18th century and into the 1840s. The population of Leeds being five times greater in 1841 than it was in 1775, put great strain on the capacity of those existing burial grounds, particularly the churchyard connected to the parish church. 1842 marks the first efforts of the town council to deal with this problem with the passing of a significant act of parliament that allowed for the opening of Beckett Street Cemetery. Before we can get to 1842, however, we start our story about 100 years prior in the 1750s with the roots of Leeds Municipal Cemeteries in the Town Improvement Acts. In that decade, 1755 to be precise, the first Improvement Act for Leeds was passed. Improvement Acts were basically a series of private acts of parliament passed in the 18th and 19th centuries by local governments as a means to gain the powers needed to undertake particular projects of urban regeneration, such as the introduction of street lighting, improvements to road paving, or general measures to deal with public nuisances of all kinds. These acts created local improvement commissions generally operating at arm's length from local corporations or other governing bodies who were vested with the powers to enact the clauses of the relevant acts. As I've just said, the first Leeds Improvement Act was passed in 1755, making reference to the familiar sources for Leeds life in that period could lead the casual reader or observer to some confusion about the need for this act. The maps and prospects that show the town in the mid 18th century generally presented as a bucolic, semi-rural environment with wide open spaces abounding. Two examples should suffice. On this first slide, we see John Cousins' famous 1726 plan of Leeds Town Centre, which shows huge spaces of greenery around the living places of the town, and including a bowling green. While this slide shows Samuel Book's equally famous 1745 prospect of Leeds from the southeast, framing the town as a peaceful arena of genteel gatherings. From this vantage, the town looks quiet and still and clean. 
Of course, it does not take an expert to reckon that daily existence in the town from the 1720s through the 1750s was almost certainly not as portrayed by Cousins and Buck. A suspicion confirmed by a description made by Horace Walpole during a visit to Leeds in 1756, in which he peeled back the layers of civic boosterism displayed in the images seen on the previous slides to reveal Leeds in all its naked glory, a dingy large town, Walpole called it. <clears throat> This then was the context for the 1755 Improvement Act, which breathes life into that word dingy and seems to make explicit a quotidian history of day-to-day -day life during the mid 18th century. A history that comes through clearly in the Act's preamble, which states several burglaries, robberies, and other outrages and disorders have lately been committed in Leeds, and many more attempted within the said town on the streets, lanes, alleys, and passages thereof. Conditions in the streets are also described, if only by reading against the grain of the Act's clauses. Residents of the town were no longer allowed to throw waste out of their homes or places of work, waste being defined by the Act as ashes, rubbish, dust, timber, dirt, dung, filth, tubs, and other annoyances, and were required to sweep outside their doors at three o'clock every Saturday afternoon before leaving said sweepings in a pile ready to be taken away. No cattle, calves, sheep, lambs or swine were to be slaughtered in any part of the street, except in a row of butcher's shops on Brigand. In short, the town centre was defined through the 1755 Improvement Act by its risks to public health, much more so than the idealised existence seen in the Cousins and Buck images reproduced earlier. Of course, the achievements of the 1755 Act, including the formation of the Leeds Improvement Commission, were not nearly enough to completely prevent the re-emergence of poor living conditions in the town, especially once the Industrial Revolution got fully underway toward the end of the 18th century. As such, further improvement acts were required, and the provisions of each tell us a little about the concerns and anxieties of residents during the period in question. In 1790, the Act provided provision for scavengers to clean the streets and for better supplying the town with water and improved lighting. In 1809, we saw provision to extend the powers of the Improvement Commission with regards to cleaning streets, paving, providing lighting to a mile beyond the town bars and for the building of a courthouse and a prison. 1814 saw the establishment of the town police and watchmen while 1824 saw provision for the compulsory purchase of Middleborough on Brigate and the removal of cattle, fruit, and vegetable markets from the street. Middleborough, in fact, was the site of Brigate's butcher trade mentioned earlier, particularly the shambles, a tight alleyway running between the town hall, which was at that point on Brigate, and the shops at the edge of the street. This watercolour by the Leeds painter John Rose shows Middle Row prior to its demolition of the 1824 Improvement Act. It is unclear whether Rhodes was painting from life, and the image could be criticised for, for presenting a romantic, idealised version of reality. Even so, the painting does show some of the features that would have brought the area to the attention of the Improvement Commission. The uneven pavement, together with the cuts of meat in close proximity to wild dogs roaming the streets. Even then, the 1824 Act did not completely resolve the matter. Evidence, of course, for the unrelenting, unforeseen, and unprecedented effect of the industrializing process. So it was that 1842 brought the biggest improvement act of them all to the town and acts for better lighting, cleansing, sewering, and improving the borough of Leeds. The size of the 1842 Act text alone tells us something about its intention and its need compared to the original Act in the century before. The former total in just 10 pages, the latter an epic of more than 100. The origins of the 1842 Act were in three bills introduced into the House of Commons in 1841 on borough improvements, building regulations, and town drainage. Wanting to preserve the improvements, the independence of the town, the Leeds Improvement Commission rushed to complete their own bill, one that would render the three commons drafts irrelevant. These efforts were successful 
and the Act received royal assent on July 16, 1842. The effect was immense. To that point, the town's corporation had limited powers, little more than the finance and management of the police, even since the municipal reforms of 1835, which had created a truly elected local authority for the first time in Leeds. The 1842 Act, however, endowed the council with major powers to improve public health conditions, as one historian, Derek Fraser, has written, through one of the most comprehensive and complete acts which had then been obtained by local authorities. The act permitted the council to acquire the authority previously vested in the Improvement Commission, greatly enlarged the existing powers which the commission already possessed in relation to markets, urban lighting and street improvements as well as creating new powers, such as the authority to lay and operate a sewerage system, organize public cleansing, manage smoke pollution, and introduce building regulations. But what does any of this have to do with cemeteries specifically? Well, while the act was making its way through parliament, other developments relating to public health and municipal control were taking place in Leeds most notably a report by the town surgeon, Robert Baker, on sanitary conditions in the town. Baker particularly noted the dire state of the two graveyards connected to the parish church, a second space at Quarry Hill had been added in 1830, both of which had become dangerously overcrowded. As we've seen, this was largely the result of the huge increase in population since the onset of the Industrial Revolution an increase from around 30,000 in 1775 to around 150,000 just 65 years later. As Baker says in the extract on the screen, it is impossible to reprobate too strongly the practice of interring the dead among the living, and to expose the health of large masses of the people to the putrescent exaltations of burial grounds, and the knowledge that a very few years only will intervene before the remains of friends and relatives will be disturbed and thrown aside to make room for others. In a few years more, when it will be thought that putrefaction has gone through all its stages in the parochial burial ground, please, it will be once more broken up for fresh internments. And whether it has been completed or not, the habitations of the living, which everywhere surround this Golgotha, will be exposed to its exaltations. The need for a new solution then was clear. And the most obvious approach was to once again extend, extend and expand the parochial burial ground at St. Peter's, as had been the case in 1830. But this was not possible. The decades since 1830 had seen a widening political gulf in the town, illustrated by some of the hand-built and political cartoons on the screen now. An increasing division, in short, between Anglican Tories and moderate non-conformist liberals on one side and radical non-conformist liberals on the other, with the latter in particular refusing to make an agreement on the grounds that they would see no benefit from the inevitable rise in the so-called church rate tax such a new parish graveyard would require. But like in 1829, when moderate non-conformists supported the passing of that church to ensure the new 1830 graveyard became a reality. In 1841 and 1842, it was becoming increasingly clear that a non-denominational municipal solution was the only possible avenue to explore. Taking advantage then of the 1842 Improvement Act, winding its way through Parliament, the Town Corporation aimed to add further clauses that would approve the powers necessary to fund, build and operate such a municipal cemetery. So urgent was the need for these new powers that a new act was in fact spun out of the 1842 Improvement Act, the 1842 Leeds Burial Act, which did indeed authorise the corporation to take the necessary steps. The Central Library holds several copies of that 1842 Burial Act, and by far the most interesting is in addition, it has been bound together with various news cuttings and other documents one of which is a detailed plan of land at Bermontops, which you can see on the screen now. That plan, though likely not produced for this particular purpose, does show the land chosen by the corporation to be the site of the new cemetery. The specific land chosen was that belonging to William Beckett, 
who had been elected as an MP for Leeds in 1841, though his neighbour, Griffith Wright Jr., the editor of the Leeds Intelligencer, approached the corporation to indicate that he too believed they should purchase his land at the left of the map on the screen now, as the existence of a cemetery in such close proximity would inevitably lead to a decline in the value of his property. You can see this better if we rotate and zoom into the plan, as now, where Wright and Beckett's land, both circles are in red on the screen now, along with Beckett Street itself, the south edge of the map. And as we can see from the letter on the screen, which has been bound together with the same copy of the 1842 Leeds Burial Act, the corporation agreed to Wright's request, such was their desperation, with a town clerk, Edwin Edison, asking that Griffith Wright let him know when I can see you on this subject. Eventually, all matters were satisfactorily resolved, and the new Leeds Municipal Cemetery was opened in 1845 with two separate sections one for consecrated, i.e., Anglican burials, and another for unconsecrated, i.e., non conformists or dissenters. This was the first municipal cemetery opened in Leeds town centre proper. But that was far from the end of this initial chapter in this brief history. The arrival of the municipal cemetery should have been followed by the final closure of the parish graveyard in 1845. That, however, did not occur until 1847. And part of the reason for that can be seen in this extract from the 1842 Burial Act for Leeds, from which I shall now quote that the council shall, on the interment of every corpse within the consecrated part of any such burial ground, pay to the vicar of the parish of Leeds the same fees to which such vicar would have been by law entitled if such person had been interred in the burial grounds now belonging to such parish. In short, this section of the Act indicates that the vicar of Leeds was entitled to the same fees for burial in the consecrated section of the new Beckett Street Cemetery, as he would have been for burial in the old parochial burial ground. This short paragraph causes significant controversy in Leeds. Why this caused such a problem can be seen in the following news cutting, which can be found bound together with the same copy of the 1842 Burial Act. The key lines are these. The town council, <clears throat> excuse me, the town council of Leeds thinks otherwise. It has determined that those fees to the vicar shall be paid out of the general fund formed from the money received from the interments in the unconsecrated as well as the consecrated portion of the burial ground, thus compelling dissenters to contribute towards the payment of the vicar's fees. In response to this controversy caused by this decision to take the money owed to the vicar from the fees paid for all burials, consecrated and unconsecrated, the corporation agreed to raise the fees paid by those wishing to be buried in the consecrated section of the burial ground in order to partially cover the fee to be paid to the vicar. That in turn caused its own controversy among the Anglican community in the town, who, perhaps not unreasonably, felt financially discriminated against. As a result, the Bishop of Ripon, the ultimate authority for any decision to close a parish burial ground in its diocese, refused to grant such permission until the fees issue was finally resolved in 1847. The published letter on the screen now from a volume entitled Reply of the Burial Grounds Committee of the Leeds Town Council to the charges made by the vicar shows the moment when the bishop made that initial non-closure decision public. The key lines are these. The matter in question is one of such serious import that I deemed it right to defer my reply until I had an opportunity of informing myself more fully on the subject. The result of my inquiries is that I do not feel myself called upon at present to make any regulation as empowered by the Act in respect of the burial grounds. I shall communicate with the incumbents of the above churches as to the period at which, at which it may hereafter be advisable to close those burial grounds. Eventually, however, as we've seen, matters were resolved and the burial ground of Leeds Parish Church was closed to new burials. The 1842 Leeds Burial Act authorised the town corporation to operate municipal cemeteries across the whole borough. Only a handful were built across the 19th century, however, 
That was not to say that the church graveyards beyond Leeds itself were not subject to the same pressures of overcrowding that St. Peter's had been, quite the contrary, in fact. The council operated cemetery had actually opened in Huntlet eight months before the Beckett Street Cemetery opened. But the major difference was that in most cases, ratepayers in those out townships organised their own burial boards under the auspices of a different Act of Parliament, not the 1842 Leeds Burial Act, which had only authorised the town council to open uh, cemeteries, but the National 1853 Burial Act. That is, local communities preferred to organise their own cemeteries rather than hand such control to the wider Leeds Town Council. One early example of such an effort is featured in a pamphlet held at the Central Library addressed to the inhabitants of Armour. It is evidently a reply to objections made by the Vicar of Armour, the efforts of some in the township to set up a local burial bar. The document reads, on Saturday last, Hamville, bearing the signature of George Armfield incumbent and Henry Wainman, church warden, were extensively circulated in Armour. These handbills tax the inhabitants Folly in permitting the burial act to be brought into the township and the burial board with error in adopting them. Interestingly, on page two of the same document, we find the Armley burial board's implication that it was a change in the fees collectible by the vicar if increasing number of inhabitants were buried in the proposed township cemetery rather than the church graveyard, which lie behind those objections. As the document goes on to say, Armfield, the incumbent, on the contrary, has a direct interest involved. He is aware that under the burial act, he will be bound to a scale of fees that cannot go one farthing beyond it. He also knows the board will take care that he has what is legally his, but not one jot or tittle of what belongs to you. The debate, however, seems to have been settled in the vicar's favour, as there is no record of a cemetery in Armour in 1887. Another out township cemetery opened after the introduction of the 1853 burial act, and that saw a significant dispute between burial board and vicar was that at Lawnswood, operated by the Headingley Burial Board. In the collections of the Central Library, we find a small brochure published just five years after the opening of that cemetery in 1875, setting out the tables of fees and charges with rules and regulations. What this pamphlet does not reveal, however, is the extent to which issues around burial fees were as present and as difficult in Headingley as elsewhere in Leeds, as we have seen. In fact, in 1892, the then current vicar of Headingley took the Headingley Burial Board to court after discovering that his predecessor had agreed to waive fees owed to him for consecrated burials unless he personally led the service. The case was recorded in the Law Times Journal, and the edition covering this dispute has been archived in the Central Library collections. On the screen now is an extract to the most relevant sections. As he's made clear in these sections, the vicar, the plaintiff Wood, was pointing out, again, possibly not unreasonably, that he cannot offer to attend at a funeral unless he know of it, and the board must give him notice. That is, the vicar was un unable to collect the burial fees he was entitled to for leading a service because the Headingley Burial Board was not informing him those funerals were set to occur. The consequence of this omission can also be seen in the claim that the burial board have permitted unauthorised and unqualified persons to perform the service in the vicar's absence. Perhaps not surprisingly, the cause found in the vicar's favour that we agreed to waive fees owed to him and for the board meeting his legal costs. The court ruled that the board had been guilty of a breach of the law in permitting any person other than the incumbent of his chairman or other duly qualified person authorised by him to perform the burial service. All the above should make it fairly clear the burial fees were a major issue in the development of the cemetery system in Leeds during the latter half of the 19th century. But as important as the underlying issues motivated disputes undoubtedly were, these arguments can seem undignified, tawdry, and in very poor taste when considered in the context of this image on the screen now. 
This is a small collection of original receipts for the purchase of burial plots at the Holbeck Burial Ground, dated 1898. Seeing and handling these receipts in all their plain simplicity drives home to the viewer what ultimately lies at the heart of those debates around burial. The final dignities of those who have passed on. That dignity seems to have been forgotten among these often petty, very political, often financially motivated disagreements. One concrete example of that final dignity in action can be seen on the screen now. And that's the famous monument to Ethel Preston at Lawrence Cemetery. This striking sculpture was a tribute to Ethel's husband to her memory on her death in 1911. The memorial soon grabs the attention of the public who flocked to see it in their hundreds as the images on the right from the Leeds Mercury in 1913 show. Interestingly and similarly, we also have in the Central Library Photographic Archive a postcard from 1921 that shows various sites of interest around Heaven and Adel, which includes the Ethel Preston Monument. This postcard provides a way of thinking about the changing role and meaning of cemeteries how they were becoming thought of as places to visit for their own sake, i.e. tourist attractions, and not just by those who had ancestors or family members buried there. Which leads us nicely into our final section. We started this brief history by stating that the story of cemeteries in Leeds began in 1842 with the development of the Leeds Cemetery, also known as Beckett Street Cemetery. That was not quite true, however, Missing from that statement of origins was the emergence of an earlier cemetery in Leeds, albeit not a municipally operated one, and that is the Leeds General Cemetery based in Woodhouse, privately owned and operated and designed to offer non-denominational burial space. Though in practice the General Cemetery became monopolised by that large group of well-off politically and socially influential dissenting and non-conformist town citizens, who did not wish to be buried in the Anglican parish church. Such was his popularity after opening in 1835 that burials there impacted on the usage of the municipal cemetery in Beckett Street when it had opened in 1842. However, the reason why the general cemetery was not mentioned at the beginning of this talk was simply that its place in this history, told largely through central library stock, has more to do with its closure than its opening. In 1956, the nearby University of Leeds purchased a controlling stake in the company operating the cemetery, which by this point had fallen into a state of neglect, but was little used with a view to the continual expansion of the university's academic and student facilities. By the mid-1960s, a final decision had been made about the cemetery's future, a description of which can be seen in a memorandum issued by the university, a section of which is on this slide. The particularly interesting part of this explanation for our purpose is in the last paragraph, which you can see on the screen now, that such steps will inevitably give rise to much concern to many people whose relations and friends are buried in the cemetery is naturally regretted very deeply. While I'm sure that regret was absolutely genuine and sincere, what is missing here, however, is any acknowledgement that the cemetery's leveling by the university should be regretted on the grounds of its status as a local heritage space in its own right. That is, not only because the removal of gravestones impacted on those people with a direct connection to ancestors buried there. This apparent non focus on the intrinsic heritage value of the cemetery, or at least the university's unwillingness to acknowledge such concerns in print perhaps explains why the redevelopment was able to go ahead, with many of the gravestones being taken down and a garden of rest being created, but the chapel itself was undisturbed. You can see an image of the new space on the screen now. Note the removal of the gravestones from around the chapel itself. This makes for a very clear contrast by the time the next major development proposal for Historic Cemetery in Leeds was made in 1984 and the closing of the Beckett Street Cemetery to new burials led the City Council to make plans for its conversion to a similar garden of rest space as the General Cemetery had become, as we've just seen. On the screen now is an extract from a joint report from the Lead Civic Trust and the then newly formed Friends of Beckett Street Cemetery Group, which makes clear that the heritage value of the cemetery 
as a core aspect of their opposition to its redevelopment and includes a promise to develop history trails and other public engagement materials should, should the changes be prevented. The key quote is this from the final paragraph. A further group of people concerned with Beckett Street comprises those who have an interest in and a love for the history of Leeds. The cemetery in its present form is as much part of the historic record of the people of Leeds as are the library, museum and art gallery collections. Just above that, we have the section declaring the Friends Group's commitment to creating heritage trails when they state, it is proposed that if the Beckett Street Cemetery is allowed to survive, a trail leaflet should be issued, which could be used by schools or by interested members of the public. It seems possible then, though further research would certainly be necessary, that the loss of the general cemetery 20 years previous influenced the nature of the opposition to the plans for Beckett Street, and especially that stress on the historic value of the site. One small piece of evidence for this thesis is on the screen now. A photocopy of a letter sent to a local newspaper, bound together with the aforementioned 1984 report, the last two paragraphs being the relevant sections. John Wellington wrote, admittedly, something needs to be done about Beckett Street. Councillor Mokes and fellow members of his committee already have good advice on this matter from Mrs. Sylvia Barnard and her friends, who urge restoration rather than destruction. And they should not forget that a hundred people turned up for a guided tour on a wet afternoon. Unfortunately, Leeds does not have a good record in its treatment of old cemeteries. According to Councillor Dodgson, when Woodhouse Cemetery, i.e. Leeds General Cemetery, was improved, the old Guinea gravestones were laid flat to make footpaths, and when the supply ran out, similar stones were made and fake inscriptions placed on them so that they looked like the others. It seems reasonably clear enough then that memories of the General Cemetery were still present when debates about the future of Beckett Street Cemetery were taking place. Pleasingly, the efforts of the Friends and the Civic Trust were successful, and the planned changes were scrapped in 1985. The Friends were true to their word and created a heritage trail, an early copy of which can be found in the Central Library collections, alongside similar leaflets for other local cemeteries. A suitable place to end this brief history, with today's recognition of cemeteries as spaces of significant community heritage and memory and a tribute to those voluntary groups that strive to protect these very important historical sites. And that's the end of the talk. Thank you for listening. Um, if you have got any questions or comments about the talk, do please contact the local and family history department using the details on the screen now. Thank you once again for your time, and we hope to see you at the future event soon. Goodbye.